yeah, so Steffi has said that this is not an ordinary German technology conference. <clears throat> she began the conference by citing Hegel, excuse me, citing Kant. And so my, my aim is to cite Hegel. It's not in the slides, but I will do my very best. And as she pointed out, indeed, this is uh, a presentation on, if it comes up, with divine inspiration, on AI and God. This might be actually the shortest presentation, because apparently my slides, which are related to, here we go, AI and God, AI or God, AI versus God. And who would actually think they could define what AI is? We've already heard many variants of it on stage today, with different speakers who are talking about generative AI and different flavors of AI. And likewise, I am certain that there is no one here who would dare to step forward and say that they could try to define what God is. In fact, we might only know it in the silence. So indeed, this could be the world's most boring talk. 20 minutes on the word or. Or not. It has been a long history in science versus spirituality and religion, and now it comes to the fore with us in terms of technology and what it is to be human. I think many of you are familiar with one or possibly two of these tableaus behind me. One of them is by the French uh, symbolic painter of the 19th century, Gustave Moreau, and the other one won first place in the Colorado State Fair last year. Does everyone know which is which? which say the, the, either say left or right, which is the one that won the Colorado State Fair? Shout it out, or, or point, yeah, I see the point. Exactly, it's this one here. But I think a lot of us would look at this and say they both are actually sumptuous and they both are beautiful, and that might be a good starting point. At the outset of, of humanism and of the Enlightenment, we realized that our place in the universe was not the singular center as a planet. We are one of multiple heavenly bodies that are, or celestial bodies, I shall say, that are orbiting the sun and not vice versa, that all of that was orbiting us. But interestingly, it was the Enlightenment and humanism that put us at the center of all that was knowable. It, it wasn't actually an item of knowledge unless it came through the human mind to be filtered and to be seen and recognized as such. And of course, the interesting thing is today we are going to be facing a similar revolution in the way that we frame our universe because we are no longer the fount of all that is knowable. In fact, we have machine intelligence that is going to know far more than we will. Whether it is scrutable or inscrutable, whether we'll understand it, is a whole nother question but you can appreciate that it is, if you will, the end of the Enlightenment and the end of rational man, because we are just one of multiple intelligences around and certainly not the most important. Interestingly, AI can be embraced for that. We shouldn't fear it and we can actually welcome it and recognize it for what it is, but it is not to say that AI can do absolutely everything. Human beings, in some ways, are smarter still, and that's what I'm going to talk about today. But let's first start with a small little reminder of how AI works, what is happening under the hood, what's going on. It is understanding patterns in data. It's parsing information to uncover new knowledge. So if I wanted to, in the classic machine learning story, if I wanted to understand how a machine can recognize uh, what is a cat, I could define a cat has fur, a cat has whiskers, a cat has almond-shaped eyes, a cat has a tail, but if any of those things aren't true because the whiskers are gone or the cat or the tail doesn't exist, then the machine would fail, so it's too brittle. But instead, the machine learning story was instead of defining a cat, what we would do is just throw lots of data at it and it would now implicitly understand what cat is like and will make a prediction that, in fact, probabilistically speaking, this image that I see before me is a cat. It used data. Likewise, by looking at data, it can not only identify things that we know, but things that we don't. It can infer elements of knowledge that surpass our understanding. Famous research several years ago by Google looked at scans of retinas, and they were trying to identify the likelihood of cardiac incidences. And indeed, it found out that through the retina scan alone, it could identify if people were on track to have a heart attack. It could make predictions, and the predictions were uncannily accurate. The age, 
whether the person was a smoker or not, purely from the eye. But more interestingly still, it was able to identify with a very high probability the sex of the individual. And this was shocking, because in ophthalmology, the scientists had no idea that it was even possible. They still don't. AI, the algorithm, is identifying something in those scans that we ourselves can't see. In fact, we may not even have the ability, retinally or intellectually, to see it, but it can. And this early finding is going to define how knowledge will be surpassed the human mind for the future going forward. AI also predicts associations. Everyone's been talking about LLMs, so let's go there now. We know how they work with tokens, well, I'll call them words for this example, that we can take all of the world's words and we can sort of create almost like a magnetic field between them on their relatedness. Are they closely related or very far away related? So king and queen are very closely related. You can see why it's the monarchy, but also you know, queen and women are related, and so women and man is related. You can make that sense as well, and so king and man, queen and woman. And so you could even say queen and pawn, that's related too. It's not, you wouldn't think of it that way, but in chess you have a queen. You could say queen and Bowie, which is a type of knife. It's also David Bowie, queen and Mercury, which is an element, but it's also Freddie Mercury, and they sang under pressure together. But woman and lawyer? If 100 years ago, if, if an LLM, if ChatGPT, came out in 1923, they'd be unrelated, nothing. There's, uh, you couldn't even imagine. It takes a human being to understand that there is a relationship to a woman and a lawyer. In fact, today in American law schools, there's more women at law schools than men. And it harkens back to the famous story with Ruth Bader Ginsburg, when she was a 1L, first-year Harvard Law School student at a reception at the dean's residence, when he asked, how do you feel that you've stolen the place of a man who could have been the family breadwinner? Now, he was trolling her. He was actually being facetious. That's what they do at Harvard Law School. But you can appreciate that where, if we were to stop the LLM back then, its conceptualization of the world would look very different than it does for us. And the reason why is that we understand implicitly the idea of maybe equality of the sexes. Certainly we do today, maybe not back then. But the LLM would be stunted, and it's stunted in many ways. That's one. Another is the very nature in which it works. Think about it as a Gaussian distribution, the famous bell curve, right? The way that LLMs work, and gender divide generally, is going to be giving you the answer smack in the middle, bang. And the reason why is because it's so careful not to avoid the drivel, something that's terrible, ridiculous, and awful, that it cuts off the tails, it cuts off the endpoints. But by cutting off something that is a ridiculous answer, it also cuts off something that's not just good and excellent and superb, but genius. In fact, it's so original, it's so unique that it looks to the machine to be completely ridiculous, and therefore it cuts it off. So innovation is going to suffer if we rely on generative AI. But it gets worse. This is not text generation, it's idea generation. Not today, but in five years, and in 10 years, and 15 years. What is going to happen to an entire generation, to an entire society, in which we're getting our ideas from a machine rather than thinking it through from a blank piece of paper together? Well, we already have a small example of what that might look like with the pocket calculator. 30 years ago, 40 years ago, in the 1930s, so it's 50 years ago now, excuse me, 1970s, I beg your pardon, when the pocket calculator was being introduced into high schools and into colleges at low cost and at scale, math teachers were beside themselves with grief that the skills of children and the mental math of society was going to decline. And it did. But it turns out that there was a benefit from it. Although we lost some basic classical numeracy, society was able to tackle harder problems. And more importantly, 
the people who could actually solve some of those problems were ones that didn't have to be excellent at math, they just had to be good enough. So it was a democratizing force, and that's great. But the problem that we face is that we have a, a, a cohort of people who really don't understand numbers and numeracy, and a small group of people that do. So the fear is that in the future, when it comes to ideas, we may have a society in which we are no longer having a class of people who understand how to f originate ideas and novel ideas and understand the construction of argument and ideas because they're turning to a machine to help them. And that small class might get all the rewards as well, so it'll exacerbate inequality. So that's a problem as well. But even bigger still is the idea that if our problems in society are getting more and more complex at a time as we as a society are becoming dumber and dumber, the two things spell an absolute holy danger. Because we will not be able to take new ideas and solve them to our new challenges. But those are the problems of AI. How do humans work? Where's the spirituality aspect of it? Well, the first element, the first cut, is in how we think about the world, and that is the idea of framing. In neuroscience and in cognitive science, we apply frames, schemas, representations, or mental models. So let me start with this. Who here wants to, well, all of you should answer, how many triangles do you see in this diagram? It's an illustration. You all have the information. No one person has any different information than anyone else. Count how many triangles you see, and when you're done, shout it out. Four. Eleven, eight, what? go on. Eight? You got your hand up like you're a student. Answer, go. Eight. Zero. Zero? What? What do you do for a living? What do you do for a living? You're a mathematician. Numeracy. So, isn't it interesting? No one has any other information. It's not controversial, it's not Brexit, it's not Trump. It's, it's it's basic. How you represent the problem determines what you see. And for some people, indeed, they count zero. When my co-authors of the book Framing did this with their executive education class, the CEOs, there were a, a healthy number of them, uh, said, you know, 15%, said zero. And the reason why is because there's no line, exactly. A definition of a triangle is that there's three unbroken lines, and in fact, there is nothing that definition of program. But if you had an odd number, if you had an odd number, uh, you will have seen this. What's happening here? What's going on? This is really interesting, because if you had that odd number, then you were not counting the information you saw, but the one that you didn't. You were using counterfactual reasoning. You were filling in the blanks. Again, it's not the information, it was the absence of information. And this idea of counterfactual reasoning is where humans excel and machines fall flat. In fact, humans are so good at it that we can look at a situation like this, and our framing immediately kicks in. A symphony of mental cognition processes are taking place from causality, clicking one to the other, falling down, to counterfactual reasonings. I mean, I'm sure you've not had any of this example happen to you yourself, so you've got no personal knowledge of it, no experience, yet you know exactly what's going to happen, you can anticipate it. And the third one is constraints. It didn't matter uh, if the person is a male or female, wearing a hat or not wearing a hat, and sure enough, the, the sad moment comes and we can see what, is, what has taken place. And this is exactly what machines cannot do. AI falls flat. So in a world in which we're constantly told that AGI is right around the corner, I would beg to differ. We're constantly told by Silicon Valley that, quote unquote, consciousness is substrate independent. Consciousness is substrate independent. Now, this is beautiful because first they take this idea of life and it's just a backhanded compliment, just rendering us all into a substrate. But behind it is the idea that we are made out of atoms, and it happens to be in biology, and we're conscious, and so therefore, why wouldn't we have a silicon chip that is made out of silicon and let it be consciousness as well? So you have to pose the question firstly, is life substrate independent? We don't know. We do know, for example, that in the case of LLMs, the presumption is that it encompasses all of reality. 
In fact, you can even find you know, validation of this idea, the primal root of the world being logos, being the word, in the scripture. And famously more still, we have Jacques Derrida, the father of French postmodernism, telling us that dans de la texte, il n'y a rien. Right? Outside of the text, there is nothing. Now, that's crazy. That's ridiculous, because actually, to have something outside, to have something expressed, is the primal, it's the result of the mental processes from inside, which an AI doesn't do. It only knows the outside feature of it, the simulacrum, not the origin. So it's interesting that Goethe in Fausta, you can yell bingo if you're wanting to know that I'm going to invoke a German thinker. Indeed, I have. Uh, when, when Faustus is sitting down, but right before he meets Mephistopheles, if you remember what he was doing, he decides he's going to translate a, an ancient text. So he reaches for John 1, and he writes, you know, in the beginning was the word, and he's very satisfied with that, his translation, Wort. And he says, no, no, no that, that's, that's not quite right. Something's wrong with that. And then he writes, idea, in the beginning was the idea. And he says, yes, and he says, no, that's wrong. And then he says, in the beginning was the force. Right? It's like, ah, and, and he's not quite right either. And in the beginning was the deed. And if you see the progression, he's going from the physical and the represented to the world, to something that's intangible, to something that is far beyond our understanding, that's there, but, but we can't sense it and see it, to finally pure verb, the act. So it poses, it, it begs the question and poses the question, is language the basis of all that is knowable and of reality and of who we are? Or in fact, is it actually simply a layer abstracted from who we are? So it shouldn't be a surprise when an LLM says, I am conscious, because of course it's been trained on all the data of people who are conscious. Likewise, the G in AGI, the general aspect of it, can you actually have generality if you're not embodied, you don't have a physical form, you don't have your senses? What about the emotional considerations, people who are making our decisions based on our emotions, not on our cognition? The whole project of AGI presumes that all a mind is and all a person is, is cognition. That all we are is three pounds of, of, of fleshy gray matter in our skulls, and that surely can't be right. The Greeks had two ways of thinking. They had logos and mythos. Logos was the analytical, was the logical, and mythos, it wasn't myth as in that which is not true. Mythos was that which is always true. It is a timeless truth. And between the two ways of thinking, they much preferred and felt that the, the better way to reason through problems is with mythos when, than with logos. For after all, logos can be applied by any lawyer in a courtroom. And it's not certain that by using that, that you get closer to the concepts of truth, beauty, and justice. But with mythos, you do. So where does this take us? AI is all logos. We're not. We've got both. We've got logos and mythos. AI uses information. We don't. In some of our most profoundest moments, we define ourselves by the absence of information. In fact, we do a lot to try to push the whole world away, and in the silence and the stillness of quiet, identify something that is true to us. In theology, it's called apophatic theology. Intelligence comes from information, but wisdom via kenosis, or emptiness. The mystical tradition in the 14th century invited us to understand the cloud of unknowing, the term of Nicolas de Cusa, learned ignorance. The Chinese had the term the Tao for that force that was empty. In, uh, in Indian religions, there is the term Shanti. When you finish your yoga practice, you say Shanti, and it translates to the peace which passeth understanding. For many of us, our most profoundest moments and moments in which we actually think we understand something about the world is in moments when we've pushed it all away and in that quiet heard a voice. Now, there's an argument against this from the Silicon Valley bros, and it's the ship of Theseus argument that says that if you replace one neuron and another neuron and another neuron, well, eventually, you could imagine you can still be conscious. So therefore, like a transistor, 
you know, all you have to do in the mind is simply imagine that you can have a level of complexity and you can have life and consciousness. But you'd have to press these same tech bros to ask, well, would that be the true if we got rid of the metaphor of the transistor running on electricity, just as there's electricity through us, and use mechanical neurons, cogs and gears? Would you still say that if you have enough cogs and gears, you'll have this emergence that suggests we're going to have not just consciousness, but also life? I personally think that's a ridiculous argument to make. Getting to this idea of the life and the life force is one of the greatest mysteries. We have no clue where it comes from. We, have, we could tell you and decrypt it in lots of scientific ways, but we really don't understand it. That if you shuffle my mortal coil, you can't bring it back. As you will simply have a cadaver, you won't have a living being when my breath becomes air. This concept of the inanimate and the atomic, or what David Chalmers would call the hard problem of consciousness, begs a deeper question, which is the harder problem of the soul. There is a four-letter word in Silicon Valley, and it begins with S. Ray Kurzweil, 25 years ago in the age of spiritual machines, predicted that our computers would become so spiritual and, and divine projecting that they will themselves want to go to church and they will have uh, spiritual experiences. But I think actually it's just the opposite. In fact, it's indeed backwards. As the world of AI goes forward, and I embrace it, I've written books and, and support it, you know, with full throttle, because I think it's going to be incredibly useful for all of humanity if we can control it well. At the same time, we're going to go, it's going to help us go back deep into who we are and to us to understand what makes us special. That in fact, to reverse the period of humanism and the enlightenment, we need to put ourselves back into the center of the universe and to recognize that there's something sacred in all of us and in the world that we have as custodians to it and as participants in it. It means we have to see the world in an entirely different way. But I think we can. Thanks a lot. <laughs>